ladies and gentlemen. When I started my career as a compensation expert 15 years ago, my father invited me to a nice restaurant across town, the Kronenhalle, because he had a friend from New York, a businessman from New York. And he proudly told this business friend, my son is going to become a compensation expert. So this friend from New York um, you know, was a shrewd businessman. He was in something you would today call digital media. At that time, it was analog. He sold information over the telephone. It was a very hard business, and he was successful in this very hard business, which is why he was very clear what a good incentive system would be. He told me, Herman, I tell you what a good incentive system is. My CEO has to buy a lot of shares in the company, and I load him up with debt that he can buy these shares. So whenever something goes wrong with the company, he's going to be bankrupt. This is a strong motivation. This was my first, impre uh, was my first experience of something that I became to learn uh, is actually to everywhere. Whenever you meet someone, you find a compensation expert. Because we all know how people should be incentivized. Unfortunately, uh, during the time of uh, my working, I found a few misconceptions in compensation that are widespread. And I wanted today to talk about these misconceptions. The first is executives are greedy. The second one is maybe startling for you as financial experts. You should link compensation to profits. Because you know, if the profit go up, the, sh the, the CEO should make money, which means then you will get the maximum amount of profits. I will show you how wrong that can be. And the final one is a very classic example of the carrot and stick. You know, if you give somebody, someone a target that they should achieve, and you compensate the person for it, then this person should do everything to reach that target. Let's start, let's start with the first fairy tale. Executives are greedy. In the media, you can only hear that executives are greedy. And this is the main problem why we have high executive salaries today. As a matter of fact, here in Switzerland, we changed the constitution because people thought executives are too greedy. The Abzugrinitiative in German can be loosely translated to the greed referendum. You know, we actually voted that you know, we should make changes to the law, to the constitution actually, that there is less greed with the CEOs. I'd like to show you that there is a much better explanation for it. But before I show that to you, let's make a little role play. Let's assume you are board members board members of a publicly quoted company, and I'm your new CEO. I'm your new CEO. I went through a very tough selection process. And we all know in this room, I'm the best CEO for you. Now, in my personal case, that's not the case, probably. But let's assume I'm the best CEO. You took a lot of effort to, to get me there. And now we are in the last round of negotiations, which is the salary. You know, salary should not really be the dominant aspect of hiring a CEO, so you do it at the end. And both of us get information about what a typical CEO would make. And I put an example together for you. Let's assume your CEO, uh oh, your CEO makes, um, uh, the, the CEOs, the peer CEOs, make. Um, on, avi on average, a medium, 450,000 francs a year. The, the best paid are making 850,000, and the ones with the lowest salary make 250,000 a year. Now, my question to you as board member, what would you pay me? What would you offer me? Medium. Medium. <laughs> some would say medium, some would say below medium, and some would say above medium. I ask this every class I go to. And we also ask this about 200 students and about 20 or 30 compensation experts. And this is the result. When you look at, when you look at what I've given you, this is the benchmark. This is the median. And this is, these are like the upper and lower quartiles and deciles uh, of the peers. Whatever I get out is typically about 23% on average higher 
than the benchmark we provided. I call this the wage anchor effect. If you have an anchor, if you know what the other people do, you cannot pay your CEO less than what everybody else pays, with a couple of exceptions. And a couple of exceptions that pay exactly the same. But the true problem is that whenever pay is transparent, it increases. It increases. It's actually not theoretic. I went, uh, uh, I had lunch just, just across from Kronenhalle in the terrace with the CEO myself, who told me, you know what, my boy came to me and said I should earn 80,000 francs more. And I, I didn't ask for the money. I don't know why. I asked them, why do I have to earn 80,000 francs more? And the board told me, we benchmarked it. Don't, don't trust us. You know, it's, it's, it's right. Um, as a matter of fact, if you are board members, our biggest problem is to lose your CEO. This is the biggest problem, because then the company is not managed anymore and you're in responsibility. So as board members, you have to make sure you're not underpaying your CEO. I believe this is a much better explanation of increasing CEO salaries that we've seen in the past. Because we make it transparent, it increases automatically. As a matter of fact, there is uh, something else also really interesting, which is, you know, the top wages typically come down, you know. Even the top quartile just increased a little bit. The lower wages are those that are corrected upwards. So it's actually not a, a really bad process. People that are earning not enough are making more, but it has a self-fulfilling prophecy to increase and increase and increase. And as a matter of fact, just yes, last week, Pricewaterhouse came out with a new study on how CEO salaries developed in Switzerland. And it is interesting to know that the SMI, the index of the large companies, saw a decrease in CEO salaries. And the other one, the S-MIME, the, the, the mid-level, mid uh, companies saw an increase of 33% in the median. So it's exactly what you see happening here in this little experiment together. Um, uh, it's exactly what's happening in, the, in real time. And I believe this is a really a strong driver of pay. Look at what happened to a very famous uh, CEO in the UK. Mr. Van der Meer uh, was hired in 2004 for 1.5 million euros. When he left the company in 2008, he made 10.3 million euros. And the fascinating thing about that is, he said, if he had earned less, he wouldn't have worked less. If he had earned more, it wouldn't have, he wouldn't have you know, worked more. He can't work more. There are so many incentives at the CEO level that it's almost impossible to perform better than what you would anyway, than how you would anyway perform um, if you if you're in that job. And funny enough, uh, in 2002, the UK started to require disclosure of CEO pay. So he started at the time when salaries were still reasonably high, you know, good salaries for CEOs. But then the UK required disclosure of CEO pay. And from then on, it decreased dramatically. More than you know, doubled in the first year, almost doubled in the second year, and so on. But there is also a second driver. There is a second driver, driver of high CEO pay. Let me, let me give you an example of this. When you look at compensation, a typical function works like this. The better you perform, the higher your compensation. This is a very classical example. Almost, you know, as a compensation expert, you always come across this issue. And let's make a little play here too. Let's assume your performance metric is revenue growth. I pick revenue growth not because I think it's the most important performance metric, because it's, but because it's one that is easily to, uh, to, to imagine, uh, kind of to imagine. Let's assume we agreed that our target should be 8% growth. As a matter of fact, 8% growth was the average growth of a large German company from 2001 to 2011. So we know in that period, 8% growth would be a reasonable target for a CEO. Now the big question is, where would you set the caps and the floor? Where would you not pay any more? At what growth would you not pay any more? And at what growth, you know, at what performance, at what revenue growth would you make the cap? Where would you stop paying? T 
typically, when I ask students, and I again did that for hundreds of students, when I ask them, I also do it for board members, by the way, in a board uh, education, when I ask them, you know, where they would set the floor, they would they typically set it around zero to four to maybe six percent, and the median is four percent, typically. People think when you have to grow by eight percent, you shouldn't get anything if you just grow four percent on the median. And when you then ask for the cap, it's about, you know, symmetric. So at around 12 to 14 percent on the median, there should be a cap. That's how we typically think of numbers. When we believe 8% is a reasonable goal for a company, then 4% should be the floor and 12, 14% should be the cap. Now if I go back to those 80 companies and look how much they actually grew, the fascinating thing is that more than one third grew less than 4%. This is, you know, all the performance is below 4%. This is the performance from 4 to 8%. And this is the performance from, four uh, from 8 to 14%. Only one third of the companies actually performs within the sweet spot of what normal people would think is, a, re is a reasonable, a reasonable uh, interval for payments. In other words, in two thirds of the cases, you would have a bonus system that doesn't work anymore. Which, which not yet explains why salaries are very high, but the fact is that there are quite a few companies that don't set caps. So they pay, you know, double, three times, four times, five times up there which gets you very high salaries. This is not theoretical. Maybe you've been here in 2009 when Brady Dugan received 70 million Swiss francs in a long-term incentive plan where his performance was measured over four or five years. I think it was five years. And that performance incentive plan was based on stock price returns. And the amazing thing was the stock price for Credit Suisse didn't move at that time. What happened? Credit Suisse thought they're especially responsible by only paying for our performance of the peers. So if you go back to you know, stock prices, they also move by about, or have a return of about 80% per year. So you could imagine when the, they assume when the stock price you know, grows like everybody else, it's going to be around 8% per year. So maybe at 16% you know, or 8% above the median, we may pay a good bonus. At 16% at, at, at above peers, we can pay a significant bonus. At 50% more than, you know, 50% better than peers, and to, uh, I think one of those peers must have been UBS in Switzerland, and only a couple that they used. If you, 50, if you grow by 50% more than UBS, you really deserve an incredibly high bonus. Everybody would assume that is normal. Everybody, you know, including me, because we all have a very bad grab of financial numbers and what can happen to that. Then let's look at what actually happened to the stock prices. This is the stock price of Credit Suisse, which was roughly there where it started at the beginning of the long-term incentive plan. And this is the stock price of one of the peers, UBS. Even though the stock price didn't move, the outperformance of Credit Suisse over UBS in 2009, when the long-term incentive plan actually vested, was over 180% something you could never imagine. I believe this is a much stronger um, reason for the high salaries that we see today. And when we come back to the questions at the beginning, maybe CEOs are a little bit greedy. But is it a good explanation for the high salaries we see? I believe not. I think the explanations that it's transparency of their pay, of their pay and leverage in the pay are much stronger drivers of high, of high CEO pay that you see today. And this but don't you think they're playing that game? They, they're taking advantage of it. You, you, you have reasons why it's going on, which, which makes sense. 
But they, they know these reasons and they take advantage of these reasons. Even if I don't assume that they take advantage of the reasons, and uh, when you talk to CEOs, you realize this, these are actually not important questions for them. When they take over a new job, they're worried that they're going to go you know, belly up or that they are not going to perform like their predecessor. And these questions are so much more important than salary for most of the CEOs that you could never explain why CEOs on average, CEO pay on average increases by 33%. On the other hand, the reasons I showed you are perfectly you know, are, are, are things that are happening and they're perfectly capable of explaining the high pay. You know, if, if pay increases by an average of 23% every year because it's transparent, if that phenomenon actually holds true, that explains already quite a bit of the salary increase we saw. But the survey, what, which kind of represents what the board would take, I would be curious what the CEO offered. You, you, you said you show them what the board's willing to pay. I would like to know what the CEO demands, what, what he puts on the table. You, you well, the typical CEO, you know, doesn't really make a demand. He says, like, let's see what the other earn. I just want to see what the other earn. And then we're sitting across from each other. Would we agree on a below average salary? <laughs> I, it's very unlikely, you know. It's very unlikely that reasonable people who believe you know, they're, they're good performers, they're right for the job, agree on a below average salary. It's very, it's very unlikely. But it, it's really important to know this because the Minder Initiative, you know, the greed referendum, assumed that executives are greedy. It addresses the wrong problem. ISS, one of the largest shareholder advisors, says that they are looking extremely uh, 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 exact on performance criteria. They want to, you know, they want to have stringent performance criteria, which means their leverage is higher. You know, if you if you make it very very performance dependent, the salaries, that means salaries are going to, you know, move stronger with the cycle than otherwise. So shareholder advisors ask exactly the contrary from what would <laughs> prevent high pay for CEOs. You know, having that in mind, you know, when you look at proposals. Um, uh, how to change the regulatory environment um, is extremely important because if you assume it's just greedy CEOs, you come to complete different solutions than when you're aware our problem is transparency and leverage. If you're, if you're aware of that, you, you, you have to look for the solution someplace else. It's hard for me to believe transparency is negative. Yeah, it's hard for me too, and we can't revert it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not something we can revert, but if we are aware that this is the reason, we are going to try to find solutions that, ad that address the reason. And this is not happening today, because still today when I talk to someone about this you know, situation, even without reading what I say, they write back, yeah, I just think they're greedy. It's, it's very widespread. Yeah. Question with regards to the caps, do you have any numbers? How many companies did introduce caps to payments? Right? Because you said, I mean, it's very much open. We have to be it's kind of obvious to say, I mean, since we know that, we put caps in there. Yeah, that's the, 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 the tendency now is to move to caps. Is there a percentage amount? Would you say one third of the companies are doing that now? I don't know exactly, but I would say the majority nowadays has caps. Unfortunately, you know, this share price based or options, for instance, don't have caps, caps by nature. And um, I actually didn't want to show this chart, but um, when you look at um, uh, when you look at what happened when Bill Clinton introduced that you can only deduct one million in salary and nothing above, um, except options. You know what actually happened? You know salaries increased a lot more, and all of that that was increase. All of that is stock pays pay and option pays pay. So again, because we're not aware of the reason of, of our problem, we are making the wrong legislation. You know, we, we are not aware that options are a big problem, which options are never kept. We allow options, or we even recommend options. And, and that's something where uh, I think uh, we have to we all have to be aware of that because you may actually be confronted with the question, how should I structure an incentive plan? And, and there are two things that you can learn from this. And one is be careful with benchmarks. <laughs> 
because they're going to increase your cost. So it's better to ask the CEO, how much do you want? And if the CEO says, I want that much, better not even ask what the competition does. If you can afford it, pay that, because it's going to be less than when you ask what the competition earns. And the second thing is when you have to structure an incentive plan and somebody comes, let's make it really, you know, really motivating. <laughs> let's put in a lot of leverage. That's exactly the contrary from what you want. It's, it's basically the message from. What, uh, may I ask, what kind of acceptance, acceptance do you get from boards uh, with your recommendation mm -hmm. that you should not use benchmarks? Because a lot of the discussion about compensation is based on benchmark and it takes a bit of strong will and strong argumentation to get away from it. And you know, there's always the problem that if you are the first one who does something different and for whatever reason it doesn't turn out to be quite good, that one can Blame for it. Yeah, well, it's the world is not black and white. There are some situations where a benchmark could be done, but doesn't have to be done. In that situation, I typically ask, you know, I tell people, recommend to people, why don't you ask first what the CEO wants, and if you can agree with that, why don't you go for that? If it's not possible, of course, because maybe the shareholders demand a benchmark, you know, there's no room to, you know, to play. Then you have to go with the flow and the wages are going to increase. Let's go to the second story. <laughs> uh, let's come to the second uh, fairy tale in compensation. You know this uh, Mark Gold?